All right, we are in John chapter 19 this morning. So go ahead and take your Bibles, open them there. If you need a, a help getting one, please just uh, raise your hand. We'll, we'll figure out how to get one to you. But we're in John uh, 19 together today. Okay, so, so just as a, a something of a preamble or a precursor to today, we are going to beginning... Uh, be beginning a a series of um, messages here, uh, starting in John 19, that they go deep into some very dark places in Scripture. Uh, It's it's very... um, disturbing some of the things that you that you read uh, and very difficult to read over. And so I just want to kind of let you know that we're going to be going there, maybe that you can prepare your heart a little bit, because some of the stuff, uh, maybe you haven't even heard some of these things that we're going to look into today, uh, or maybe you have, and, and it's just that reminder and just to, to be brought back to the reality uh, of what sin costs. Uh, and so today we're going to be looking at essentially the punishment for sin begins. That's kind of where we're going to be starting today in John 19, and we're, and we're looking into Jesus beginning the crucifixion, the, the process of going to the cross and bearing our sins. Have you ever um, gotten in trouble for something that you didn't do? Ever happened? Maybe you have to reach back a few years, or maybe it was just yesterday. Uh, but you, you get in trouble for something that you didn't do. I remember one time, uh, I, I grew up on a, a street, very small town, a little mountain town. And uh, one of the things that we did was we always had gravel in our driveways. Uh, and so uh, there were, people did not have paved or concrete driveways unless you were rolling in the Benjamins, all right? And so we had gravel, and, and people would literally take their pickup trucks, go to gravel pits, fill them up, and then just take them to their, their driveway, and that's how you... You got gravel for your driveway. So that's what we used to do. And, and I remember uh, one, one day we were growing up, and I grew up at the end of a street that literally dead-ended into the forest, all right? And so uh, we would, the neighborhood kids and I, we would play all the time. And I remember one time we were bored. Uh, it was a summer day. We were bored. We didn't really have anything to do. And we were outside hanging out. And uh, uh, one of my, I think it was one of my friends uh, had the idea, let's get our bats and let's hit rocks into the woods, Sweet idea. What could go wrong? And so we're out there. We're, we're just, you know, lift, throwing little rocks up and hitting them with our bats and hitting them out into the woods. And it's awesome. And, you know, we feel like we're doing home run derby and it's pretty amazing. Uh, and so we're there uh, doing that. And then all of a sudden, one of, the, one of the kids throws it up and he's tilted a little bit sideways. And uh, he, he catches the rock. It glances off of his bat and it goes right into the front window of my house and it shatters, and oh no, now what? And so uh, my mom uh, was at work, and I got to mull over and stew over, what is she going to do to me when she gets home? And no matter how much I tried to explain to her, it wasn't my fault. I actually didn't do it this time. I know all those other times I probably did, but this time it was really the kid across the street. I still got in trouble for breaking the window. Um, uh, uh, there are times in our lives when you end up getting in trouble for something that you didn't do. And and today we're going to be looking into something where Jesus gets in trouble, if you will, for something he didn't do. It's kind of a a very uh, lighthearted example of what Jesus is doing, but uh, it's something that paints a picture for us to help us to understand that Jesus is taking a punishment for something that that he has no business taking. Now, what I want to do before we get into all this is I want to introduce you to, maybe you already know, but just to kind of get our minds here into a theological term that you've got to understand before we get into all this, or what's going to happen is you're going to start thinking, this was such a great and nice story and it had such a terrible and tragic ending. I don't want you to, be, to get caught in that or be tricked into thinking that whatsoever. I want to make sure that we get this right, we get this straight, that when we read through this, we don't read how, what a terrible, tragic thing that happened to Jesus. We think, what great love God has for me. That's what we should be thinking. That he planned this. He purposed this. He did this on purpose of his own volition, of his own will. He went toward this, completely yielding himself to this, not in any way thinking, man, this other, you should be doing this and I shouldn't have to. There's none of that in Jesus whatsoever, okay? So, so here's the theological term, okay? It is called the penal substitutionary atonement, okay? So that's, that's the term, the term uh, yeah, it's, write that down, 
Share with your friends. You'll sound super smart. Uh, <laughs> penal substitutionary atonement. Okay, so so just uh, I don't. I could we could do a, a, an entire series of messages on this. Okay, so I'm just going to try to really briefly describe it with the help of my super nerd friend Wayne Grudem, um, uh, who wrote a systematic theology book about this. So you're going to feel like for a second we're in a systematic theology class, and it's on purpose. Okay, so I, I'm trying my best to abridge this and to give you the condensed version, all right? So the condensed milk of this, all right? So that's what I'm doing for you. Uh, and, and so we're, we're, when we understand this, essentially penal means that there is a, a, a penalty involved. That, so that's that word, penal. Uh, if you've ever um, had someone who works in corrections, they're a penal officer. They, they work in some sort of corrections, all right? So that's penal. Substitutionary means not me, someone else. I'm standing in for you. That's substitute. Right, that you have a substitute teacher, they're teaching in the stead of your real teacher. Okay, substitutionary atonement. We've talked about this in the past a little bit, but essentially the easiest way to understand this is to to break down the word at one meant that that there's there's a relationship that is brought back together. Okay, that's what atonement is. So Jesus, when he goes to the cross, we've got to understand penal substitutionary atonement because if we don't, what we end up doing is thinking, man, Jesus was such a great guy. Why'd they treat him so bad? And we forget the fact that he's taking for us, absorbing in his body the wrath of God against sin. We'll think that maybe the Jews betrayed him and that's why he went to the cross. We'll think maybe the the Romans were just really mean bad guys and that's why he went to the cross. No, that that is not the reason. The reason is because that's the price of my sin. So as we talk through this and as we go through this and as this is a very heavy, very difficult message, uh, I find myself just, you know, tears uh, running down my face as I was studying this week, trying to prepare for this and just realizing this is, this is, I deserve this. And I don't, I, don't, I, don't deserve, I don't go through any of this because Jesus did it. And so I'm going to try to keep my composure as we talk through this. Um, but it's, it's very graphic and it's very difficult and it's, it's very painstaking. But if we, if we get it wrong, then we focus on all that and we think that, man, Jesus was such a good guy. Why, do you, why did that happen to him? And we forget it's my fault. It's my sin. And he took it for me because of his great love. Okay, so, so keep that straight. Okay, so now here's, here's the basic systematic theology version of penal substitutionary atonement. Okay, there's four problems we have. We'll put this on the screen for you. We've got four issues, all right? Sin causes four problems. All right, now there's more than that, but these are the four major problems. Okay, number one, we see that we deserve to die as the penalty of sin. That's problem number one. You get that? You deserve to die for the penalty of your sin. That that's the the payment. The wages of sin, Romans tells us, is death. So the the right payment that I should receive for my sin is to die. Okay, secondly, not only we see that, but we also see we deserve to bear God's wrath. I said, I put what? That's terrible, sorry. Uh, Wrath against sin. We deserve God's wrath against sin. That's autocorrect, by the way. Autocorrect doesn't like wrath. They like what? (laughs) None of us like wrath. Okay? And thinking of of God with this wrath is not the way that we tend to think of him. We think of him as like Santa, right? This big fat guy in the clouds with a nice beard. Yeah, hey, uh, thank you. Um, So it's a great technician back there making it happen. We tend to think of, of, of God as this big fat guy in the, in the clouds with a white beard saying, it's okay, and he's winking at your sin. No, God hates sin. He hates it. And his wrath rightly is poured out against sin. And I deserve it. Thirdly, uh, yep, yeah, all of them are going to be wrong. Uh, we are separated from God by our sin. Okay, this is a major problem. The, that, that God is holy, that God is perfect, that God is just, that God is absolutely perfect in who he is. Uh, James tells us that he is light and there's no shadow of turning. There's not a, a, even a, a part of a shadow of darkness in God. And because he's perfect, because he's holy, because he is absolutely set apart and holy and perfect, no sin can be in his presence. And because I have 
the smallest sin, I can't be in his presence. That's, that's absolutely a problem. We're separated from God. Fourthly, here's our, the next f- problem. We are in bondage to sin and to the kingdom of Satan. This is a problem. This is a major problem of sin. Have you ever thought, I don't want to do that? And then you do it again. Have you ever thought, I hate this. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I wish that this, this sin was gone from me. But you find yourself in bondage to it, enslaved to it, that it controls you and you, you don't have rule over it. This is, this is the reality of the problem we have in sin, that it controls us, that it rules over us, and that Satan is the one who has dominion over this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He's the one who has, has dominion or rule or authority over this fallen world, and we are submitted to that kingdom. We have major problems. We have major issues. And you look at this and you think, there's no hope. There is absolutely no, what, what can I do? No matter how many old ladies I walk across the street, no matter how much money I give, no matter how many good things I do, that will never take away the fact that sin has destroyed everything. Now what? The, the bleakness and the darkness of this helps us to understand the brilliance of the glory of God. You know when you go to buy maybe a diamond I remember when I did that for Micah. I've only done it once because it turns out I'm a pastor. Um, and so <laughs> pastors who have lots of money are mostly illegal and doing stupid stuff. Anyway, so, um, so I bought one. And one of the things that they do when you go to these diamond places is they, they take out this black cloth, silky and black and amazing. And then they take this diamond and they put it against the black. And the reason they do that is because it pops. And you see the brilliance and the glory and the splendor and the the light shines so much more detailed and intricately against the black backdrop. And when we see this black backdrop of our depravity and our problem and our issue, then when you see the glory of Jesus and what he's done for you, it doesn't cause you to think, oh man, poor Jesus. It causes you to think, how great is my God? So we have four issues. Now, the next one, please. Uh, We also have Jesus' penal substitutionary atonement. See that? Uh, Satisfies all four of these problems. Okay? So so Jesus is the only one who can do any of this for you. So the first one that he does is sacrifice. Right? This solves our first problem, our first major issue that we deserve the penalty of sin. And so Jesus sacrifices himself. He pays the penalty. His death pays the penalty for my sin. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Hebrews 9, 26. He pays for it. Secondly, not only do we see that, but we see propitiation. Propitiation is a big theology term that means that he has appeased God's wrath against our sin. That God's wrath is rightly poured out against sin. But because Jesus has taken my substitutionary atonement, he's taken the the penalty of my sin, it subsides God's wrath. This is why there there are no longer any animal sacrifices being offered by Israel. Because you had to offer animals on repeat. Because animals, they could cover sin, but they couldn't take it away. But the perfect, spotless Lamb of God removes your sin. He doesn't cover it. He removes it. The stain of sin that's blotted on your soul is removed by the blood of Jesus. Thirdly, uh, 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 the verse for that, 1 John 4.10. 1 John 4.10. Thirdly, we see reconciliation. He restores the relationship. Our problem is that we are separated from God by our sin and Jesus reconciles us to God. That his act on the cross, his going toward this pain, willing to take our sin upon himself, it reconciles us to God. 2 Corinthians 5.18 and 19. Fourthly, we are in bondage to sin in the kingdom of Satan and we see fourthly and finally, Redemption. He paid our ransom and set us free. You you owed a debt you couldn't pay. All of your blood poured out. All of the good things you could do from now until the end of your life and then sacrificing yourself still wouldn't pay for it. But Jesus did. He redeemed you. 
The idea of redemption is to pay the ransom for your life. And then as he pays your ransom, then he sets you free. And we read in John 8 that he said, who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's an amazing thing. You see, he paid our ransom and set us free. Mark 10, 45 tells us about that. Today, we're going to be looking at this as Jesus begins to pay for our penalty. All right, this is, you've got to get this. Because if you don't get this, then when we read John 19 and we look at what's taking place and we go through these parts together, you're going to end up all mixed up and you're going to think the wrong things. And you're going to end up with a weird theology about how people are mean to Jesus instead of about how God's great love is for you. So we've got to get this straight, okay? So here's our big idea today as we move into this section in John 19 together. By his stripes, we are healed, okay? Stole that from the Bible. <laughs> Isaiah 53, 5. So keep that in mind. The stripes have a purpose. You're healing. You're healing. How? Well, we just told you the four, those four ways. Okay? Now, those are the big categories that everything else fits into in life. All right? So let's read John 19, 1 through 16 together. And as we read through this, we'll go back through it and we'll, we'll uh, take it apart piece by piece. John 19, 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put him in a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Then Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am, uh, behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was all the more afraid. And went again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Then Pilate therefore heard this saying. He brought out Jesus and sat down in the judgment seat at a place which is called the pavement in Hebrew, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was, a, uh, it was the preparation day uh, of the Passover, uh, about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king! And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar! Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Today, as we look at this section together, we're going to be breaking it down into three parts. Three parts, okay? The three parts are verses 1 through 5, that the king is innocent. The king is innocent. Secondly, 6 through 11, the king is in authority. The king is in authority. And thirdly, and finally, verses 12 through 16, the king is rejected. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we study through this section together. And, and just to to remind us back of what's happening here. It's that Jesus, it's by his stripes that we are healed. He's no victim. He's a victor. We just sang this in the song before, just before, that, that his love shines in victory. He's victorious, not a victim. So have his, have his uh, position straight as we go through this. So verses 1 through 5, firstly, we see the king is innocent. Now look, look back with me if you would at verse 1. It says, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. It's a very simple verse, a very passing verse, something that you could read right over and just move on past and not really grasp and understand. 
It's something that is very, very easy to completely miss. There's a single word in this verse that we quickly read over, and because of our modern context, we completely miss the meaning. And I'm not sure why, but uh, all, of, all four of the Gospels treat it this way, and, it, and they do the same with the idea of the crucifixion. They basically say he was crucified, uh, and that's all that they really say. Now, I'm not really sure why uh, they, they do that. It could be very well uh, that they are not focusing on that so much as the resurrection of Jesus, that they want to get the point across, Jesus died and he raised from the dead. Also, it could very well be that they understood full well what this meant. That, that in their context, in that day, you would just say that word and fear would strike the heart of any man. That, that no matter how strong you are, no matter how courageous you think you are, this word would, com- would reduce you to nothing. This idea of being scourged. It, it, this word scourged uh, was the beginning of the crucifixion process. And it can only be described rightly as torture. That's the only right word for this. There's no, there's no other explanation for it. There's no other category for it. It only fits in the idea of torture. Now, what this means is that they would strip Jesus naked. And they would take him into something of a courtyard and there would be a pole, a post, in the middle of this courtyard. And they would tie his hands, sometimes their feet, Uh, to this post. And they would tie his hands in such a way that his his back would be exposed and he would be stretched out. And and he would be completely exposed in this moment. And what they would do is they would uh, take this Roman whip called a a flagrum. Uh, You may have heard cat of nine tails. That's not it. It's not a cat of nine tails. Cat of nine tails is something that's a little bit more modern that they uh, would use uh, in, uh, uh, in the UK uh, as a way to bring punishment. Uh, the reason they call it a cat of nine tails is kind of, uh, a cat of nine tails kind of leaves marks the way that a cat would uh, on you, so it's designed more for punishment. This flagrum uh, makes that look like child's play. Okay, this is not that. This is something completely different. Now, the flagrum, what it is, is it's a, 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 a short whip um, with th- th- uh, thick leather in it, and there would be these weighted lead balls at the end of it and throughout it, uh, and they would have uh, pieces of bone and metal and glass embedded into it, so that way when it was to strike the victim, it would literally rip the flesh off of their body. But this is what it would do. The, the lead would give it weight, so it would come against the skin and essentially tenderize your skin, and and muscle and sinews. And then the pieces of bone and glass and metal would sink in and rip the the flesh literally right off your body. And they take Jesus, and we read over it in one verse. They scourged him. Now, the way that they would do this is typically there would be uh, two lictors. They call them lictors. There's, that's the, the, the soldier that's assigned to administer this punishment. Typically, there would be two. One would stand on either side, and they would in succession go from either side, uh, um, you know, working, uh, taking turns uh, to go across this. Um, alternating blows, and they would have surgical accuracy. The, the Romans were known as experts in torture. Uh, they, they, were, they weren't haphazardly going through this. This was this man's job. That's what he did all day, every day. And just like you probably get good at something that you do all day, every day, they were very good at what they did. What they would do is they had to actually be careful in, in doing this because this was such a brutal beating that the, the person would be given that it would expose bone and internal organs. Okay, so this is not a couple scratches. Your rib cage would be showing. Your organs would be showing through this process. And this is is where Jesus is enduring. He's done nothing wrong. He's brought healing. He's brought kindness. He's, He's given sight to the blind. And it's, it's, him going to this process. It's this alternating blows on either side. Now, there is no limit to this. What they, what they, they didn't have a certain number. They would just go after the, the prisoner until they felt it was enough. The flagrum would literally 
shred the back, the buttocks, the thighs of its victim. It was so vicious. It would literally render its victim unrecognizable. Unrecognizable. We're told in Isaiah, I'll put it on the screen for you, Isaiah 52, 14. It says, But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one could scarcely know he was a man. This is what produced that. And I don't know if you've ever seen a fight where it was pretty bad. That's not even anywhere, anywhere close. He's beaten beyond recognition as a, as a man. You see, the Romans were experts in this torture, and the, the process would literally bring the victim to the point of death. That was the point of this, to inflict as much pain, as much torture as possible in order to bring the, this victim to the point the point of death. Now, many people wouldn't even survive this process. And if they did, then they would die within two to three days, just from blood loss and from being, uh, um, uh, inf having infection. Uh, it would take two to three days, and, th and that would be it. And they, they said, if the gods want to save you, they can save you. That, that's, that's essentially what they thought. And then, okay, maybe you were innocent. This is kind of how they dealt with this. It was very, very brutal. Now, I want to take you to a, a piece of scripture because uh, I, I was going to write it out for you, but I, I'd, I'd like you to turn there. So turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 53, if, if you would with me. Isaiah 53. Um, if you need to uh, look in the, the front and find the, the page number, don't feel embarrassed whatsoever. Um, sometimes it hides. It's just before uh, Jeremiah. Um, Isaiah 53, and, and, and if you are one who marks in your Bible, I want to encourage you to mark something here. Um, start in actually Isaiah 52, verse 13, um, all the way through the end of Isaiah 53. And in my Bible, I just have written Jesus in there with an arrow down, and then uh, at Isaiah 53, 12, Jesus at the end with an arrow up. This is prophecy about Jesus and the death he would die. Now, I, I just want to pull out a piece of this for you and just look at this with you and, and see this together. I want to look at verses 4 through 6 and read what it has to say in Isaiah 53 because this gives us not only what Jesus is going through, but what's taking place. Isaiah 53, 4 says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As you read this and as you look at this and you see the description given for us here in Isaiah 53 and also uh, Psalm 22, what you read is very clearly thousands of years before this ever existed that the prophecy was given about how Jesus would die, how his life would be given, what he would do, the, the things he would endure. And we see here it says by his stripes. This word stripes literally means blows that cut in. This, this is exactly what Jesus is going through when he's scourged. It's by his stripes that you are healed. That, that Jesus going to this cross, he gives himself to it completely. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't stop it in any way. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't silence them or, or, or slow it down. The scripture says something specific about the result from these stripes. He, it says that it's by his stripes that you're healed. This healing could mean either physical or spiritual healing, okay? That this, this has a double meaning that it could have, it could possess. Now, I tend to think that it means both. I tend to think that it means both. There are some who like to argue one way, there's others who like to argue the other way, and I think that it has something to do with both. This healing could mean one or the other. I've personally experienced being a part of both of these. Uh, um, I remember there was one night when 
uh, Micah and I were uh, going to sleep, and um, she was just complaining of having this terrible headache that had just plagued her all day, and she was uh, just really frustrated with it. And, and uh, I sympathized with her like a good husband, and then I went to sleep. Um, <laughs> and as I rolled over to go to sleep, I felt the conviction of the Lord say, hey, how about you pray for her, bro? Maybe God doesn't talk to you like that, but that's how he talks to me, okay? And then I'm like, what? How terrible. I didn't even pray for my wife. I want to call myself a pastor, and I, I pray for people, and you can come forward, and I'll pray for you. And I won't even pray for my wife. And so convicted, I just silently prayed for her. I didn't, I didn't even move because I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. I don't want to make a big show out of it. I, just, I, wanted, I wanted to just be obedient to the Lord. The next morning, Micah goes, hey, by, by any chance, did you pray for me last night? Because all of a sudden, after I told you that I felt like I, this headache that would not leave me all day, miraculously, it was gone and I had the best night of sleep I've had in a long time. And I think that's crazy. The Lord brought healing upon her. I've had people who I've prayed for where they, they have this dire uh, prognosis from the, the, the doctor and they say, would you pray for me? And I pray for them. And they, they go back the next week for another checkup. And whatever was there isn't there. I remember specifically there was one uh, lady that came forward and she said, my grandson has to go in for these scans. He's got a bunch of issues and problems within, within his brain. And they're just trying to figure out what to do. Uh, so would you just pray that maybe he would lie still enough so that when they do this CAT scan, they can actually get a good scan of him? Uh, because the previous time that they tried this, they couldn't even do it. It was just too crazy. And, and so they, they had... Uh, um, already given the diagnosis for him, but uh, they wanted to be able to confirm some more and get a, a better detail uh, of what was going on in his, in his brain and, and what was happening with him. And I prayed that the Lord would not only allow him to lay still, but that they would find nothing wrong and that he would be healed. And she came back the next week, overjoyed, ecstatic that God had healed her grandson. Crazy. You have a miraculous loving, healing God. Now, I don't know why he chooses to heal some and not others. I can't tell you. I don't have any power to heal anybody. All I know is that God has graciously used me to somehow extend his love to his people. It's his healing. I can't call upon it the way I call upon the gift of teaching. I can do that at any time, in any place. I can I, Just give me a Bible verse. So let's, let's learn about it. I can do that at any time. The gift of healing is not like that. It doesn't work that way. And any knucklehead that says that they can is a liar. They're just trying to get your money. Don't trust them. Run away. Okay? That's, that, it's just not true. Now, not only is there phys physical healing a part of this, but spiritual healing as well. I have talked to countless people, hundreds of people, people upon people who say, I have submitted myself to the Lord and I've, I've brought myself into the fellowship of his church and just by the clear teaching of his scriptures and the love of his people, I've been miraculously transformed. Sin that have controlled me no longer does. Uh, priorities that were jacked up and mixed up in my life, all of a sudden fixed. And I, it's not because I, I just tried really hard. I've tried really hard and I failed over and over and over and over again. All of a sudden, spiritual healing is just administered and poured out because of the grace of God. It's by his stripes that you are healed. This isn't that these mean guys did some bad stuff to Jesus. This is Jesus saying, this is how I'm bringing your healing to you. I'm going to purchase this for you. So let's go to him and ask him for it. Lord, would you give me the victory that I can't get on my own? Stop trying on your own. Stop going your own way. Stop pursuing it on, on your own. You don't have the strength, but he does. He does. And he proved his great love for you. Jesus didn't have to endure a single blow, but he faced the torture, the worst torture in human history. So most historians say, this is the worst, most torturous way to die. In human history, he faced this. Now think about this for a minute. Jesus didn't have to come into the world at that time, right? He could have waited till now and just, you know, taken a sleeping pill or something and, oh, I'm just, I died, that's all. He could have done that. He could have had all the modern conveniences of iPhones and, and inside plumbing and air conditioning, but he didn't. He chose that. He chose then. He chose that method by which to purchase your salvation and your healing. That's what Jesus did. 
See, after they ripped Jesus' flesh from his body, notice verse 2. Go back to John 19 with me if you would. So he's beaten and he's bloodied. And then verse 2 says, Then the soldiers twist a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. They shove it down into his scalp. And the thorns would have pierced his skin and slid under uh, against his skull. They put, the, put on him a purple robe. And they say, Hail the King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. And other, other gospels tell us that they actually gave him a, a staff as a kind of a, a fake um, king thing. I don't know the words out of my head. Scepter, thank you. And they would take that from him and they hit him with it. They would, they would put a bag over his head and they'd hit him and they'd say, Prophesy, who hit you? Mocking him. Not only did they just beat him beyond human recognition, literally beat him to a bloody pulp, but now they, they begin to mock him. How many of those blows would you take before you stopped it? Would you even take one? Maybe as, as his hand is flying across the air, just pause time for a second. I don't think I really want to do this right now. I'm out. How many blows would it take for you to call those 12 legions of angels to come and decimate the human population? How many? And blow after blow after blow, Jesus takes over and over and over and over. And then, and then they mock him. As Jesus is literally giving his life for those men, for me. As I, as I put myself in this story, I put myself not with those weeping and, and hoping for Jesus. I put myself with those mocking Jesus. It's my voice that cries out, crucify him. It's, it's, it's my sin that calls for his punishment. Jesus has been tortured and interrogated and humiliated and mocked. You see, the, it's interesting that it says that a crown of thorns was used. That, that should take you back to Genesis 3. The only reason that thorns exist at all is because of the fall of humanity. In Genesis chapter 3, that when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, cursed is the ground for your sake. Now it's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. The only way that this, these thorns even exist for Jesus to have this mocking crown shoved down upon his scalp is because of our sin. It's because of, of our depravity. It's because of our fallenness. And as it shoves down into his scalp, he endures it. He endures the curse of my sin, of your sin. So verse 4, we see that Pilate went out to them again and he said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And Jesus had been tortured and interrogated and humiliated and mocked and now Pilate brings Jesus out and again declares his innocence. You guys remember that? He just did last week. In verse 38 of chapter 18, he declared the innocence of Jesus and now he's declaring the innocence of Jesus again. I'm bringing him out to you so that you'll know that I don't find any fault in him whatsoever. You see, the scourging that would go through was typically, it was an interrogation tactic. It's what they would use to extract information or extract a confession when the Roman government believed you were already guilty of something. And so they would take you and they would beat you. And if you started to confess things, then they, were, they would lighten the blows. Little by little. But if you said nothing, they would get harder and harder and harder. And we're told that Jesus was silent through this entire process. There's no mercy given to him whatsoever. And so now Jesus has gone through this entire process, confessed absolutely nothing. And if there was ever a doubt in Pilate's mind whether or not Jesus was guilty of anything, it's completely absolved now. Who in the world is going to go through this and not confess to anything? Jesus. So Jesus is brought back out again and Pilate says, I want you guys to know that I absolutely find no fault in him whatsoever. And I, I wonder if Pilate is maybe trying to appease the bloodlust of this mob. That, that maybe, that they're, they're crying out, crucify him. And, and Pilate's thinking, you know what? I'll just, I'll have him scourged and that'll be enough. Maybe that's where he's going with this. I, I don't know. I can't, I, I can't tell you Pilate's motive. But it seems logical to me. 
It seems like he's just trying to get his way out of it. It seems like at every turn he's trying to figure out another way out of this situation. So here, Jesus, Jesus is scourged. Paul's trying to maybe appease the bloodlust of the mob and, and this innocent king, this innocent Jesus. And he says, look at him. Look at him. And I think a lot of times we don't want to look at this, this brutality, because it's, it's gut-wrenching. It's hard. I, I don't want to see Jesus that way. I want to see Jesus with little kids and lambs and smile on his face. That's, that's how I like Jesus. Not a bloody mess. Not the flesh ripped from his body. Not because of me. We need to behold, behold Jesus in his full, humi- full humility and full humanity taking what I deserve. The penalty for my sin. That's what I rightly deserve. But I don't endure any of it. Not because God's a big grandpa in the sky saying, it's okay and winking at your sin, but because Jesus took the penalty for you. Secondly, not only is the king innocent, but but, uh, the king is in authority. Verses 6 through 11. Let's read that. Verse 6. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw that they Uh, saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Innocence is declared again. Verse 7, then Jesus answered him, we, uh, excuse me, then uh, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. With this brutal picture of Jesus Uh, Enduring this Roman scourging, it would be easy for us to forget that he's the king, that he's in control, that he has done this on purpose of his own will, that this was the plan of God before the foundation of the world. We would think of him as some sort of victim, that he's not in control, that somehow these guys have overpowered him and that they've arrested him and now Jesus is, is somehow this victim, not at all. Through all the torture, Jesus demonstrates immense courage, strength, self-control, and an iron will. And we've got to see that in him. We've got to see that Jesus could have at a moment stopped it all. Jesus could have at a moment spoken all these people out of existence, but he doesn't. He takes it. Every single blow, every single humiliating thing, every punch in his face, the beard ripped from his face, him being spat upon and mocked and ridiculed, and the very people he lovingly comes to serve, crying out for his crucifixion. All of it he endures. All of it he takes. Never doubt the love of God for you. He took all this to heal you from the penal atonement from the the penalty you deserve that penal substitutionary atonement jesus took for you i gotta think i was on his mind while he was taking that and i'm not really sure why but jesus was saying this is worth it what an amazing god we serve verse six we see that finally the Jews believe they have Jesus cornered, right? We've been chasing this guy down. We've been trying to kill him. We try to push him over a cliff. We've tried to stone him. We've tried to do a lot of different things, and it just, it's not working. And now we finally got him cornered, and though he's innocent and had proven many times over that his identity is God, they still wanted him dead. They still wanted him dead. So the Jewish leaders now see Jesus as indistinguishable from any other man, and from so severe a beating, and they have absolutely no compassion on him at all. The Sanhedrin cries out for his crucifixion now. You see, people do insane things in order to protect their their position, their comfort, their power, their paycheck. They'll do crazy things to protect those things. These these Sanhedrin, they they were in control. They were the spiritual leaders. And Jesus was disrupting the apple. He was turning the apple cart over. They couldn't have that. And so they wanted him dead. And they wanted to make sure that they made an example of him. If anyone thinks they're going to come and do this nonsense, you're going to suffer what Jesus suffered. And so they take him through this, not realizing Jesus is in full control and they have nothing. That he's taking this because of his choice. You see, 
They're willing to torturously murder an innocent man just to protect their own comforts and their own power and their own position. But Jesus, Jesus didn't make himself anything. Notice that that's their, their claim, verse 7. He ought to die because he made himself the son of God. That's why. Jesus did not make himself anything. He didn't make believe. He didn't make this thing up. And in fact, he had proven over and over and over and over again his identity. But they, he just didn't fit what they thought. He didn't fit what they wanted. And so they're, they're willing to murder him in order to do this. They're, they're completely unwilling to see him for who he is. And so we read in verse 8, it says, Therefore when Pilate had heard this saying, he was the more afraid and went again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. You see, fear struck the heart of Pilate in a deeply intimate way, and he became very interested in the origin of Jesus. All of a sudden, something hits him, and I don't know if it's because he's you know, a superstitious kind of a man, or maybe that he had come to believe, maybe there's more to this Jesus guy than I thought before. Maybe he's more than just this good teacher, or this guy that the crowds like and that have now turned on him. Uh, maybe there's something more to him. I don't know really what's going on, but his heart is struck with fear. This is the only gospel that tells us this about Pilate. And he's struck with fear and he goes back and he wants to know, Jesus, where are you from? Who are you? I need to know something more about you. And Jesus says nothing. Jesus had already told him. In chapter 18, we, they already had a conversation about this. He said, my kingdom is not from here. I'm not from this world. And if I was, I would fight right now, but I'm not going to fight because that's not why I'm here. I've already told you where I'm from. I've already told you who I am. So he remains silent, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 53.7. So Pilate believed that he's in charge, and notice what he says in verse 10. So he says to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Pilate tries to use intimidation. I'm the one in power. I'm the one in control. I'm the one with authority, Jesus. Don't you know that's who I am? You're not going to talk to me? So Jesus answered him, you could have, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Pilate uh, believed he was in charge, but he failed to understand that he was in the presence of the king of kings. He thought he was in authority as just this governor of a region, not realizing that he he was in the presence of the one who spoke creation into existence. The one who formed Pilate and fashioned him in his mother's womb. Gave him the traits that he had, and gave him the strength that he had, and had actually allowed for him to have the position of authority that he has. We're told that in Romans 13, that God's the one who positions authority. You see, Pilate had no real authority. He proved that he was only able to do what the crowd commanded. That's not, that's not power, that's being a puppet. That's being a pawn. That's what, pawn, that's what he had. He was a pawn. He had no real power. He could only submit to the, what the crowd demanded. In this, we got to see that even leaders who reject God are still under his jurisdiction. Now, they may not wield their power and their authority the way that God wants them to. They may not do with their authority and their position what God wants them to, but they are still there by the, by the power and authority of God. All authority is derived from God, all of it. What is done with it is distorted and perverted and twisted satanically to do what is evil and what is wrong. Your rebellion against God, don't think of it as them, but think of it as the authority I have. I got, I got authority over my life. I can do whatever I want with my life, right? I can do my thing. Your, your authority over your life or your rebellion against God doesn't make you free from responsibility and accountability to him any more than it makes any leader that we have. You are still accountable. You are still responsible before the Lord. You have, you have no freedom over yourself if you use that freedom for sin. That's not freedom, you're a pawn. You're being used and manipulated by your flesh and by the devil in order to do that which, that which is sinful. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, we'll put it on the screen for you, says this. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Jesus establishes himself as the very source of authority from which all other authority is derived, including this little bit of authority that Pilate enjoys. And he's misusing it. He's misrepresenting God with his authority, but it's the authority that has been given to him by God. And so Jesus declares here that I am the one who's actually given you this authority that you think you have over me. And then he says, but you're not even the one that has the greatest fault in all this. Someone else does. You see that there at the end? Now, what he's not saying is Pilate has no fault. Right? Someone else has a greater fault is what he says. And, and there's a lot of theologians who argue back and forth on who this could be. And uh, there's a bunch of different reasons why. Uh, we don't know because he wasn't specific. But I tend to think maybe it was Judas. That's where I tend to go with it. Uh, and contextually, that's kind of where I would think that that's where we're at. But who knows? Maybe he was thinking of something else. And so Jesus places himself here. Thirdly, and finally, we see not only is the king innocent, the king's in authority, but, but now, verses 12 uh, through 16, the king is rejected. Verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard this saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Uh, I don't know how to say that right. Um, and so here we see uh, that Pilate realizes that he was caught in the middle of something much bigger. All of a sudden, this is, this is kind of spiraling out of control, and this isn't just another guy. This isn't uh, some sort of evildoer now that I'm rightly punishing. Now something else is happening, and it's more than he originally thought, and he can't figure out any way out of it. Difficult situations, difficult situations do not produce character. They only reveal the character that's already there. Okay. So when you're, when you, when you make a bad choice or you say, you know, you, you did this, therefore I did this. Like you say that to your spouse. Uh, it's, it's, don't say that. <laughs> they didn't produce that in you. They're just revealing to you that it's already there. When you step on a skunk, you know what happens? It smells like a skunk. Did your stepping on the skunk make it smell like a skunk? No, it always did. You just stepped on it, and then it smelled like a skunk. Now, if you do the same thing, you step on a rose. What happens when you step on that rose? You, you crush it, and all of a sudden, this perfume fills the air. Your stepping on it didn't create the perfume. It just revealed what was already there. Difficult situations in your life do not produce character within you. They reveal the character that's already there. They reveal what's already inside of you. So as Pilate is here, stuck in this position, unable to make the right decision, it's not because the difficult situation is upon him, it's because he has poor character. It's because he has chosen poorly before. It's because he wasn't ready before this time happened. You've got to decide before you're in the situation. You've got to submit your heart to the Lord before you find yourself in the situation. So that the character of Christ has worked in you because the situation is coming, the hard time is coming. It's like motorcycle riders. If you've ever ridden a motorcycle or you know a motorcycle rider, there's only two kinds. The ones that have been down and the ones that are going down. You wreck on those things. That's just what you do. That's why my wife never let me get one. You just, you're going to wreck. That's just the way it goes. That's just how it is. And so too it is with difficulty and problem and tragedy in our lives. You are either in difficulty now or it is coming. That is just the way it is on this side of heaven. And when you're there, what will you do? What decision will you make? Which way will you go? Will you choose what's hard? Will you choose what causes you to sacrifice? Or will you be willing, like Pilate did, to sacrifice somebody else for your own comfort? To satisfy your own position? To secure your own authority? You won't be able to make the decision in the moment. You cannot. You've already made it. It's today. As you continue to pursue the Lord or not, you will make that choice. You will make that decision. Your character is not produced in the hard times. It's revealed in the hard times. And so here Pilate is revealing an ungodly character. And so Pilate, being unwilling to take the suffering upon himself, is willing to pass it on to Jesus. And so this mob mentality is, is uh, not able to influence, uh, excuse me, Pilate's not able to influence the mob mentality uh, through, through the beating of Jesus. And now, so now they, in, they inflict political pressure in order to get what they want. So Jesus here, essentially what they say is, it, it, whoever makes himself to, a king is not the friend of Caesar. This is the political pressure. And so Pilate here, 
just, just so you kind of get the feel of this, Pilate doesn't know Caesar. Some historians say that the only reason he got the position that he's in is because he's married to uh, Caesar's daughter or granddaughter or something like that. You know, like he's, he's got a family in and that's why he's got that position. He's not the friend of Caesar whatsoever. And so he's trying to gain the friendship of the world, the friendship of someone who doesn't know he really even exists. I mean, he's given him the station of, yeah, just go, go to Jerusalem, go over there, you know. I don't want to deal with you. He's not in Rome. He's not an official there. He doesn't, he doesn't personally know Caesar. He's just, he's an outcast on the outskirts. He's trying to, to do whatever he can to hold on to his power. And the more he grabs for it, the more he tries to bring it in, the more it slips away from him. And the more he makes the wrong choices and the wrong decisions. Pilate's relationship with Caesar was more important than his relationship with Jesus. And I wonder if that describes some of us. That I want that relationship with that person over there. I want that relationship with them. I, I, I value this relationship more than my relationship with Jesus. And so because of that, because of that, I end up putting myself in a position of compromising all of them. James 4.4 4 says this. I'll put it on the screen. It says, you adulterers. It's interesting that he uh, attributes this to adultery. That's, that's important to grasp. He, he attributes this concept to adultery. He says, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. It can't get any more clear than that. I don't think I need to really explain that. James is really good at saying, here, let me punch you in the face. Like, ow, <laughs> thanks James. See, choosing Jesus does, uh, does not make you their enemy, the world's enemy. Do you know that? They may not like you for it, or they may treat you like an enemy, but you are not their enemy because you choose Jesus. But if you choose them, you make yourself the enemy of Jesus. You can, if you aim at earth, you get nothing. But if you aim at heaven, you get the earth thrown in as well. We've got to reprioritize, re realign ourselves to put Jesus where he belongs and to pursue him and to chase after him. And so Pilate is chasing after Caesar, and he's missing Jesus. Verse 14. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then they delivered him to, the, uh, to be crucified. So they took, him and led, took Jesus and led him away. Pilate seems to be unable to recognize. I'm sorry, he seems to be able to realize that Jesus is really no physical threat, but that he actually has a spiritual kingdom. He, he seems to realize all of this. And so he sees what the Sanhedrin could not. And he says, this is your king. What are you guys doing here? But the Sanhedrin denounced Jesus. The Jewish people cry out because he didn't fit their idea of what they wanted the Messiah to be. They were willing to blind themselves to their own scriptures in order to preserve their religious ideals. We, we've cited it for you already, but read, please, this week, read Psalm 22. Read Psalm 22. Read Isaiah 53. Read these sections of scripture. Read them about Jesus. Read them about what he's going, because next week we're going to go into the cross itself. This is just the first part of the crucifixion with the scourging. Next is the cross itself. And as we see this, we see that it's very specific, very clear. You see, I, I want to point out a few scriptures for you about how the Lord has, brought the, uh, has foretold all this and how they blinded themselves to their own scriptures. In, in Daniel chapter 9, verses tw 25 through 26, we have the 70 weeks of Daniel. Specifically, uh, they, what they do is they place an exact date on when they could expect for the Messiah to come. That, that it says, from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah will be a certain number of days. Jesus was specifically predicted to come. And you know when that was? Right about 32 AD. Right when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Right when Jesus came in on a donkey and sacrificed himself. Fulfilling Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 40, um, Psalm, I believe it's 68. There's tons and tons of verses about Jesus and the prophecy of him. 
Micah 5.2 says that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Do you remember when the, the, the wise men came looking for Jesus? And they said, hey, we followed this star. And then uh, they, they talked to Herod. And Herod says, well, let me get the Jews and say, where's Messiah supposed to be born? They say, well, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. They knew the scriptures, but they weren't willing to even look for him, even though he was there. They used the scriptures to give them the answer, but they wouldn't see it themselves. Isaiah 7, 14 says that he would be born of a virgin. Genesis 49, 10 says that he would come from the tribe of Judah. Zechariah 9, 9 says that he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. This over and over, this is just a few. This is five, five places, five specific things that you couldn't accidentally do, right? You would have to, you'd have to be pretty amazing to accidentally happen upon fulfilling all these prophecies. And Jesus does this and hundreds more fulfills hundreds of prophecies and they blinded themselves to their own scriptures because he didn't fit their idea. He didn't fit what they wanted him to be. How often do we look past Jesus and what he's doing because he doesn't fit the way we think it should? It doesn't look the way we think it should. It doesn't show up. A lot of times opportunity shows up in your life, but it, you miss it because it, it looks like it's got work clothes on. I wonder how many times we miss Jesus he just doesn't look the way we think he should. He's, it doesn't feel the way we think it should. And so we just completely miss him. Because we're wrapped up in our own ideals. We're wrapped up in our own thoughts. We're wrapped up in our own uh, uh, things about the way it should be or the, the utopian concept. And it's just not true. When you're distracted by your ideals, you won't be able to discern reality. That, grasp that. When you're distracted by your ideals, not ideas, ideals, Here's what ideal is. When you're distracted by that, you will not be able to discern reality. You can't. It's impossible. Reality will be right in front of you and you won't even see it. Just like they were with Jesus. See, the reality is rejecting God and thinking that you're getting freedom and enjoyment in life is actually bringing you deeper into darkness and death. And they didn't realize it, but that's what they were enduring. Don't reject Jesus. Don't reject his penal substitutionary atonement for you. He has saved you from the wrath of God by paying with his own blood, literally, physically, given for you. And he's paid for this to free you from the power of sin today, from the penalty of sin when you stand before God when you die, and from the presence of sin in eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for the chance to study it. And Lord, as we look upon you and this scourging that you're willing to endure for us, God, it, it's really difficult to read. It's really difficult to understand because what we see and realize in all of this is my sin is worse than I thought. We might be able to explain it away or think that somehow it's not as bad as it really is, but Jesus, it, it required your torturous, brutal death. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you for proving your deep love for us, for me. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to honor you with our lives and to believe in you and to place our faith in you and our hope in you, to abandon the darkness and come into your marvelous light. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.